people that are in the audience because there's a bunch of people here. We got a whole room full of people. Yeah. Super excited. We're going to get going now and we'll figure out the chat here in a little bit. But my name is Bronson Hill. I'm the CEO of Bronson Equity. We're doing multifamily deals, ATM deals. We've got our ATM fund open now. We've got some other alternative stuff that we're doing as well. These guys are awesome multifamily operators. We are waiting on Dave Lindahl. We're hoping that he will show up. So we're crossing our fingers. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to introduce uh, our, our group here. So we have Ferris Musa of Disrupt Equity. Welcome, Ferris. Just got to see you at your MFIN conference uh, in Atlanta this weekend. It was great to see you. How are you doing today? Doing good. How about yourself? And well, well, I'm really excellent. It's been a long, uh, been a long three days. It has, yeah. For you guys, you guys talked about you're hitting the ground run and doing everything. Oh, I just spent three days since I've seen you. You know, so <laughs> yeah, we didn't get I to know. talk much on Saturday, but definitely, you know, it was good seeing you. Absolutely. No, it's really great to uh, great to see you. Um, and we have a lot of good stuff to talk about here. We also have Patrick Grimes from Invest on Main Street. How are you, Patrick? Fantastic. I missed both of you at the event. I was doing a baby shower, but heard great things. Been been knocking it, hitting the ground running ever since. Though. So. Congrats awesome. on that baby shower. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's getting ready for his uh, his his new life as a dad. So excited yep. for that. Um, awesome. We're going to go ahead and get started here in just a minute, but we're going to jump in and talk about how multifamily has changed because there's been some significant changes. Everybody's feeling it with rates rising and a lot has changed. So let's just kind of jump right in and let's talk about some of the changes. I know Ferris at your conference, we talked a lot about this. There were a lot of interesting panels and interesting uh, conversations around just the changes that are happening. Can you maybe give an overview of you know what's happening in lending? What are you seeing as far as deal demand? Uh, what are some things that are happening today? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'd say at a high level, right? You know, back in April, the world was normal. And, you know, in April, interest rates started to, to, to go up, right? You know, everybody, I think unless you've been sleeping in a rock, you, you know that interest rates have been moving up, right? So that's obviously had a, you know, an adverse impact on multifamily. And so with rates going up, the cost of capital goes up, right? And with the cost of capital goes up, right? The, interest, the, the loan amount that you typically get is tied to how much interest can you pay? And so if interest goes up, the loan amount actually gets smaller, you know, which ultimately results in what? A reduction in pricing. And so the summer was rough for a lot of people, right? Especially all the deals that were already under contract, ourselves included, had to get back out there, renegotiate deals, you know, renegotiate the lending and, and really figure out how do you structure the deal to be able to get it across the finish line. And, you know, that's ultimately resulted to where we are today, right? Which is a market where there's not as many buyers. A lot of people are just kind of waiting to see, right? And at the same time, you have sellers that, realize they missed the boat a while ago, their high expectations are still up here. And slowly, you're starting to get that price discovery, right, where they're starting to settle, right. And so right now, there's, you know, offers that talk to brokers, right, there's deals that used to get 30 offers. Now they're getting five, right. And so and that's ultimately at Disrupt Equity, that's really the opportunity we see, right. We have very close relationships with our brokers. And we're looking for those deals where there's a motivated seller needs to get out, not getting many offers and ultimately makes it a little bit easier to compete. So, yeah, there's this, uh, we call it the seller or buyer standoff, right? Where sellers are looking back and we're both buyers and sellers. I know you're a buyer and seller as well. I think all of us are buyers and sellers. And so, but we look back and think, man, this is worth so much more just a little bit ago. And yet, and it's still cash flowing. So it seems good. And yet we're, we're finding, you know, pricing is there's some pressure on pricing for people that have to sell. Patrick, what are you seeing right now? What are some things that uh, are coming up or just as, as you're looking at multifamily, what are some of the, how are some of those, uh, those uh, changes affecting your business? Well, as Ferris pointed out, April was the month. In fact, that was the month we closed on life at Spring Estates, property not down, just down the road from where he set up. And we got a 3.4% interest rate on that. Um, thankfully, we bought a rate cap, which is something that is resulting in some of the distressed operators that Ferris was alluding to that uh, that rate cap's already paying out as interest rates rise. Now um, that rate cap is now sending us capital every month to pay our, our loan, which is a fantastic position to be in for us. But as we move forward, we saw lots of people taking on bridge debt, the debt that with variable interest rate, um, and not looking at their deals, underwriting their deals, making sure that they'll cash flow in the cases that interest rates went as high as they did. Um, so there's, to, to Ferris's point, there's some people that have the ability to hold. There's some people that have the ability to ride it out because they're still cash flowing um, they, or they're living off reserves. Um, there's a handful of deals I know that are currently losing 10, 20,000 that I've heard about from my investors a month, but they're riding the reserves and they're hoping that the interest rates will go down. I think some of those may weather the storm. 
Some of those yeah. may make it through and some of them may not. And we, we just picked up a deal in Atlanta. It's five and a quarter million discount, had a 14% delinquency during COVID and a building burned down. So they didn't have the right debt structure. Uh, interest rates went up, their cash flow went down. COVID hit, their delinquencies, people stopped paying. And then they had a building burned down. And so when, so you have those combinations of is, That's issues. That's a really bad day, right? If it's a really bad day. <laughs> And, and those are the types of deals that we're seeing that come to that. Well, you know what? Five and a quarter million discount with even the greater interest rates we're paying over the next two years, we're only paying 500,000 more in interest over two years because of the greater interest rates. But we got a five and a quarter million discount. It's like a 10X return. It's a really solid play for those right. distressed assets. So we're getting some uh, some feedback about the lingo, you know, the cap rates. I know that we need to kind of break down the layman terms a little bit because there are folks that are very experienced in advance, some that are just kind of a little newer. So uh, I want to talk for a minute about uh, interest rate caps because this is something that is confusing to a lot of people. So uh, obviously, you know, there's a, a the, about 85, 90 percent of large multifamily debt is through floating interest rate debt that has, you know, a lot of times you have to purchase a cap or like an insurance on the interest rate so it doesn't go higher. So when you talk about it, it's almost like uh, it's starting to pay out after a certain point. So it goes to five and a half or six and a half percent. And then this interest rate cap starts paying out. Now the cost for those interest rate caps or this insurance has gone up 10 X or 20 X or a lot. Uh, Ferris, and, and we're actually seeing this as well. In one of our deals, we're, we're cash flowing really well in the deal. And all of a sudden these caps are like eating up now a lot of the cash flow in the deal. So we're having to reduce distributions just to cover the cost of those interest rate caps. Are you seeing that as well, Ferris? Or what are some things you're doing to try to mitigate that? Or how are you managing that for maybe existing deals you already have? Yeah, so I mean, there's not a lot you can mitigate, right, to do to mitigate. I mean, you know, the cost is what it is, right? But thankfully, again, that's just the lender. You know, and maybe let's just rewind a little bit, right? So for everybody on the call, cap rate has nothing to do with interest cap. Two different things that just happen to use, both use right. the word cap, All right. So an interest cap, what does that mean? As Bronson mentioned, right, we're buying floating rate debt, meaning that the debt, the interest rate that we're paying is tied to what's going on in the market. That's great, right? That means we typically can get, you know, cheaper, better loans. The risk you run is whenever interest rates are rising. And so we are in a rising interest rate environment. And thankfully, right, we bought our interest cap. And so what we're saying is, hey, we are hedging our risk, right? Basically saying whenever interest rates go above a certain threshold, we are no longer responsible for it, right? The cap, which is a product essentially that we bought, right? It will pay the difference above that threshold to us. And so really we know what our max exposure is from an interest rate perspective. And typically these caps are buying two, three, four year caps. After that time period, you got to reevaluate. And so back to your question, Bronson, you know, cap rates are, have gone up, right? We've all bought our caps already. What's increased though is the reserves, right? The lender, the cap that used to cost $50,000 now costs a million and change, right? That's the reality of what we're saying. So whenever the lender was just growing $1,000 a month because, hey, whenever you get to year three, it's that $50,000 cap's gonna cost $50,000. Well, guess what? That's gone up 20, 30, 40 X, right? In costs. And so now your interest, your interest reserves or your uh, interest rate cap reserves have gone up significantly. And, you know, that's just cash that you have to have, right? So there's only really two ways to mitigate it. You either had extra reserves and kind of prepared for it, right? Thankfully, we've gone into deals with significant reserves, right? Or you eat it from cash flow. And so, you know, kind of two sides of the same coin. There's not a lot for existing operators to be able to mitigate. And that's where we find some operators are kind of belly up, right? They didn't have the reserves. The interest cap has gone through the roofs. And now, you know, they're in a negative cash flow situation, which is not a good situation to be in. Yeah, so that brings up, I mean, the question, you know, comes down to Warren Buffett, who I study a lot and we talk about a lot on the Mailbox Money Show, my, my podcast, which I've had both of you guys on as well, which has been great. Um, but, you know, we talk about, you know, he talks about rule number one of investing is don't lose money, right? And rule number two is don't forget about rule number one. So, you know, it's really important that anything you invest in, whatever asset class, you understand the risks. So, Patrick, what are some new risks that you're seeing? Obviously, the interest rate caps or the, you know, to have the insurance to cap those interest rates is way more expensive. So even, you know, though you have the cap interest rate, the cost to, to maintain those are, are expensive. Uh, what are some other risks that you're seeing right now? And I know a lot of investors are seeing more risk and obviously as well as kind of the wealth effect of the stock market down and just, there's a lot of concern out there, but how are you, uh, like what risks are you seeing and how are you looking at multifamily right now? Well, so from a from a passive investor's perspective, I think you want to take a look at your sponsor and just check to see if they've been through a market correction before. And I think what some of the risks that you can we can sort of lay out here 
aggregate all from, did they stress test or did they, not to use normal terms, did they make sure that they had the right assumptions in their modeling, both to be conservative or reasonable in the projections that they made and to focus on capital preservation. In other words, making sure that the capital that you invested, they don't lose is like a primary goal. And, and I think that there's a lot of things that can be challenging. A lot of operators uh, will try and get in and out of deals very quickly. They're kind of flippers. And they're writing, they're hoping that the valuations won't have a dramatic shift. They can get in, they can destabilize, they can uh, empty a property, fix it up, and then sell it real fast. Well, unfortunately, right now we're seeing some temporary changes. I mean, you know, the values of properties kind of decreasing in some ways. So some of the I think is the biggest risk is stay away from the short-term flippers right now. You want to buy for cash flow. And that means the property needs to be, you need to put a big enough down payment down. You need to be able to cash flow, which means you got to be able to pay your loan payment. You need to have a rate cap that, as Ferris was pointing out, your exposure being the highest that can go still allows you to cash flow, right? And then in recessions, you tend to have job losses. Some industries are more effective than others. And I did lose everything in 2007 and eight and nine after I did a pre development and I saw how the demand can shift and how models can break down. And that's led me ever since to be very humbled. And I only invest in where recession resilient markets. And those are ones that have employment, that finance, healthcare, logistics, you know, types of industries that have built an insulation. And so you want to make for market volatility. You want to make sure that going into a recession, you're investing in a market that has survived well. And that means as long as the employers are healthy, then they can pay the residents that are ultimately paying you, right? And you want to see what, what happened in those past recessions. Did, they, did the vacancies drop to a big point? Has does the operator made sure that the deal can still survive if that happens again? And are they putting reserves aside? And I, I've, I've seen deals with no reserves. I've seen deals with 50,000. And like Ferris and I partnered on a deal and there was six to eight months in reserves. I mean, that's, that's like saying you can float the entire property for six to eight months. During a recession, you need to be well capitalized. You need to ask your sponsor what happens when vacancy drops. And then one other thing happens, a flood, a fire, you know, can you ride that out, right? Do you have enough reserves? I think those are probably the biggest things that you're going to see. Yeah. And that's something, you know, we're seeing as well It's just, you know, we try to look at, you know, where's the growth happening and we buy in markets, like all of us buy in markets where we see population growth, job growth, income growth. Um, we're also, you know, we do a value add approach because we're seeing, you know, Jacksonville rents are a thousand bucks. We see after doing a $6,000 renovation, we can get to a 1500 or north of 1500. So regardless of what happens, that forced appreciation provides some safety there. So we like for that reason, B and C class. Ferris, what are you seeing are ideal deals to look at these days? Like what are, what kind of deals are you looking at or what sort of opportunities are you seeing and what sort of, you know, things you think are important to, these are things that we especially look for in our deals right now. Yeah. So, I mean, right now we're really focused in mean, location, location, location. You hear that a lot. And, you know, we've done rough deals and rough locations and we've done easier deals. And given kind of the current environment, right, really working through the bad debt and making sure you're buying deals with quality tenant bases, quality locations makes life easy. And, you know, as a company, we're kind of focused on late 90s and up right vintage right now, given the current environment. And really, I think it's I think you asked the wrong question. Right. It's not really about what kind of deals. It's really what kind of structures. Right. I think, these, you know, the structure is what can make any deal work. Right. We're going in lower levers than we did before. Really, you know, kind of surplus of reserves. Right? And ultimately going to our investors and saying, hey, you know, we're comfortable presenting a lower IRR, right? Because ultimately that, if you want to get into a deal, that's what the market looks like today, right? At the same time, going in with a lower IRR, but reducing the risk significantly, right? I mean, yes, you know, you could say it's a higher IRR and go in higher leverage, but you're introducing risk. And so right now we're really focused on deals where we're probably going in 55% on the leverage side, right? So we're bringing 45% of the equity, you know, much smaller note, much smaller reserve requirements, and just working through the merits of the deal, right? Good locations, Still like to have some sort of value add component, but we're we're not focused heavily right now on C's. I mean, right now it's just the cap rates between the C's and A's are starting to widen, which is good. But I mean, they've been so narrow for so long, right? Meaning, you know, the C class property down the street that's 50 years old is selling from a cap rate perspective, right? Meaning return profile, 
almost the same as the A class. And in Atlanta, sometimes, you know, we saw the where it's even tighter than an A class. And so the, as that starts to widen up, you know, we will we will start to maybe look a little bit more close on that. But right now we're kind of focused on that 99, late 90s vintage and up. Yeah, that's great. And every, I, you know, every operator has their own focus and what they pick at the time to, uh, to look at. And we're going to talk about some other uh, assets around multifamily or things that are maybe outside of the traditional space as well, just because there's some opportunities there. But uh, let's, let's talk about kind of what we see right now. We see, obviously, everybody's watching the Fed. You know, interest rates have moved. That's kind of the big thing that's happened, you know, from 3% to about 7% when it comes to a mortgage or comes to a lot of the lending that we're seeing. Uh, what do you see kind of the next? I'd love to hear from each of you. We may have very different opinions on this, but I, which I welcome. But what do you see over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, kind of both in the uh, kind of macroeconomic picture as well as multifamily? Let's start with Patrick on that one. Yeah, so uh, the uh, values in my in over the next you know eighteen months, you are going to see some value correction. Uh, the the sellers have not yet completely adjusted to the new realities, and we are going to see some some potential values in the short term, which I consider short term because I'm a long term investor. I don't look for quick wins and and high quick quick gambles. I look for long term cash flowing sustained investments, and so. You're going to see some correction. You're going to see some prices go down. Um, inflation is playing a role. Uh, inflation is playing a role in our supply chains. Uh, it's playing a role to help delay things. We're seeing some issues with just being able to turn renovations and be able to get to the components we need to execute our business plans. So and that's going to be, that's definitely going to play, um, continue forward for say the next year, year and a half. However, with interest rates rising, I really see it in a couple different ways. With inflation, and I have an article I wrote in Forbes on this topic, but with inflation and income generating real estate, our profits oftentimes go up. And because of our large multifamily investments, what we see is that our, our, our revenue, our rents are twice as high as our expenses. So if you play, if you put the same inflation rate on the two of them, you've actually created a spread. You've actually created more profit, right? If you fix your interest rate, you fix your, your loan, then that increases a greater amount, which means maybe you don't make money with inflation, which you can, but at least you're hedging with inflation. Now, so in our situation, interest rates are going to continue to grow up as long as inflation is going up, right? But then our income tends to go up as well. Um, our valuation goes down slightly of the properties because the cap rates or the how the properties are valued will we'll shift some with interest rates. But the minute that interest rates or inflation stops, we're going to find ourselves in a recession, maybe finally somebody will announce. <laughs> and then in order to get out of recessions, they lower interest rates. So these workforce housing, as we're saying, which was that being a C-class word, in good markets, as Ferris was talking about, structured in the right long-term sustainable cash flowing way, they're hedged to do very well in these markets. They just have to be purchased right. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's about finding the more patient investor. Because the individual, if you find the right like-minded investor where the tortoise will outpace the hare, then these market cycles are what these investments are built to withstand. You're on mute. I was having a great conversation with myself there. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, long-term investments, having a long-term approach, making sure you're buying right, love it. And there's going to be an opportunity as, as you know, things unfold here. Uh, Ferris, what are you seeing the next 12 to 18 months? And obviously no one has a crystal ball, but what do you, what do you foresee? Um, I think what's interesting is thinking through what the maybe 12 months from now looks like, right? You, you, I mean, I'm already hearing the rumblings of deals that it didn't have interest caps. And so that's already definitely a problem. I mean, situations where people need to get out and deals that have expensive interest caps or last but not least, right? There was this period of time where you kept seeing deals underwritten where people were basically not properly modeling the exit, right? They were modeling the exit based on an LTV perspective saying, hey, whenever we refi this deal, we're going to be 75% loan to value. But in reality, right, if you model it with a DSCR, which means kind of essentially what, how much more positive cash flow is left, a lender was never going to give you that big of a loan amount. So your loan amount is going to be a lot smaller, right? And so what that means, you know, is A, the, what they thought they'd get on a refi is going to be less than reality. And more importantly, with a higher interest rate, 
right? Your DSCR actually has, you know, basically gotten reduced. And so ultimately people that thought they're going to be refining are going to really struggle and going to have to make an exit. And so you're going to have, I actually think, you know, we're continuing to be very, I guess, rigid in the deals we want to pick up right now. But I think in about a year from now, you start to see a lot more deals on the market of situations where sellers need to get out and probably, you know, give some pretty attractive opportunities for buyers to come in well capitalized and essentially structure the deal more effectively, right? And hopefully, you know, get into a strong asset and continue to perform from there. And so I think, you know, right now you're still in this discovery phase and that's fine, right? We're being, you know, kind of buying the right deals, going in well capitalized. But I think in a probably a year from now, it's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be, you know, the, the spring or the, the end of the winter, right? I'm thinking probably fall of next year, you'll start to see a little bit of a snowball of deals hitting the market of where, you know, people need to get out of their deals. And so we're kind of patiently waiting to see what happens there. And then, you know, again, just stress testing all of our portfolio and just make sure we're sitting in a comfortable position. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, it took me a minute to get off mute. A hundred percent. No, I, I want to give my opinion as well, because um, I, there's a friend of mine named Jeff Clark who works with goldsilver.com. And he said that he put up a chart and showed these are the times the Fed has raised rates. And, you know, from the time of the first raise to the time they start cutting, uh, it's typically, it's, it's always between five and 13 months. And so, you know, I, I'm wondering if in the next three to six months, we could have either a uh, recession or a some sort of financial event or crisis or some sort of thing that, you know, uh, we have to maybe something in the financial system breaks and they have to start lowering rates again. So that's my thought. But my thought too, as well, is a lot of people are like, oh, I, I'm cooling off on multifamily, but I, I see just incredible demand for multifamily if you could make it work. And I think this is a time right now that in two, three years, we'll say, man, I sure wish I had bought more during this time right now. And the reason why is because when you buy, your buying price is fixed, your interest rate can potentially be adjusted later. So what happens when rates normalize, they kind of go to a normal level, the ownership cost is going up. I still think it's a great time. Now, investor sentiment is not there. We still have some great deals we're doing. I think you guys have great deals you're doing as well, but it is an interesting uh, time to see. Um, I will add actually a few things, right? Please. I, you know, I don't know if interest rates are going to start dropping in the next three, four months, right? I, I think they're, they're, I think they will continue to raise probably mm -hmm. longer than expected and flatten. And so, you know, if I think if people are buying with that assumption, they're putting, you know, it's kind of a risk. But the thing, you know, the silver lining is two things, right? In an inflationary environment, Patrick mentioned this, but, you know, I kind of want to drive this point home, right? You do get wage growth. Now, yes, they don't keep up. Right? Growth is faster than wage growth. But ultimately, any real estate is typically a very attractive hedge against inflation, especially something like multifamily where your contracts cycle every year, right? It's not like office where you're a retail, you might be in it for five, 10 years. And so, you know, it helps you keep to pace. And so again, you go in expecting 2% rent growth and you're getting an averaging six, seven, right? It's a very different deal if you can sustain that for two, three years. The other thing to note too is there's more money sitting on the sideline now than there ever has been. Yeah. So there's a lot of pent up cash out there. They're looking for, you know, some glimmer of hope, right? That, hey, we understand what the world looks like. And I do think there will be, you know, a lot of money starting to get, you know, looking, to, there's a lot of patient money waiting to get deployed, but there's a ton of money out there. And if you just look at just the amount of money that is currently parked, I mean, you look at the charts and it's just off, you know, off the, the charts compared to where it was historically. Can I add something to that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so a couple of things. I stir the pot maybe a little bit because Ferris made a comment where you know, kind of, kind of like next year in the fall, maybe we're going to see some dramatic deals. But I'll tell you what, I want to counter that a little bit because being, I mean, I was there in 2007 when the market was never going to fall, right? And it did. And I realized because I was more speculating on residential pre-development at the time, and I. I, they drug me through the coals and I, I became that person where I felt like the market might fall off every single year from then on. And I continued doing deals, but very recession resilient and risk averse deals because I don't want to necessarily be a predictor of a down economy. I want to build and structure deals, as Ferris said, in a way so that they'll survive a down economy. And actually every single one of the decks that I've created says underwritten and performa with an eye towards what happened in eight, nine and 10 versus 2015 through 2020. And so like the deals we're doing now, I think we're finding some incredible deals today. We would have never gotten a $5 million discount six months ago. And there's there's been investors that I'm talking to, like the ones Ferris was talking about with 
10 million dollars on the sidelines waiting for another 2008 and i think that i resonate a little more with bronson when he says that they're 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 waiting for something that that may not happen but they're missing these incredible times because those funds on the sidelines right now are getting hit dramatically with inflation and our investments which were 130,000 per investor on average have gone up to 330 what does that mean that means the sophistication the net worth of our investors has just dramatically gone higher since this downturn. So there is the fear mongering on the side, but the more intelligent, sophisticated ones are deploying their capital today in the right assets that are structured correctly. So we're going to have a time to go over some questions here in about 10 minutes. I'm looking through the uh, the live attendees and there's some real heavy hitters in the room here uh, virtually. So I'm looking forward to some questions we're going to put in the chat in a bit here too. But this is a really good point that I think it's important to bring up, right? We have an investment, investment return. We also have 40%, 40.9% new currency created over a two-year period between February of 2020 and February of 2022. So we've got this environment. And, and just to your point, Ferris, we've got I think I just saw a chart that showed we used to have about a trillion dollars in cash kind of on the sidelines. And now there's like five trillion in Americans' pockets that's just kind of waiting there. So with people that have cash, I'm sure people on this call or people that are, are, are watching this as a replay have money and are saying, what are some of my options? So obviously multifamily is an option. Putting cash on the mattress is an option. It may not be the best option, but uh, Ferris, what are you seeing some of the other options uh, beyond multifamily, or what are some strategies that you're seeing uh, being employed now? Uh, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, you know, ultimately, as an operator, right, we look at it as we help investors deploy money into a deal with a current environment in a protected way, right? And so, if you want to deploy right now, our position is, hey, it's going to be a lower IRR because we're going to have a lot more cash, and you know, that's what it is, right? Um, other things, I mean, right now, you know, everyone is going crazy over the. Uh, you know, the treasury bonds, right? There's the, the I bond, which again, you have $10,000 limit, but you're getting a stellar return from a very safe investment, right? That was the fad about three, four months ago. And, you know, ultimately savings accounts are attractive, right? I mean, you're getting a three and change, you know, return on essentially no risk, right? So you are seeing people that have been kind of moving more and more money into that, right? Waiting to see, hey, what's going to happen? And once things happen, you know, I'll go ahead, I'll deploy. But in the meantime, I'm comfortable with my three, four percent. And so, you know, the, yes, there's all sorts of opportunities out there, right? You're seeing more things around, you know, carbon recapture. I know you guys are familiar with that, right? That's been kind of another trend that you're seeing. Um, but there's not really anything that I think, hey, this is just, you know, everybody's getting behind this and this is kind of where the, the industry is going right now. There's still just a lot of wait and see. And then, you know, as Patrick mentioned, right, more of the sophisticated investors are investing, right? They understand kind of the market and what's going on and, Usually, you know, a lot of times that could be a buying opportunity, but it's kind of wait and see for most people. Yeah, I know that's a really good point. I think, uh, you know, as a multifamily operator is what you do. And I think that's what we do. And and we've kind of branched out some other stuff as well, which I'll share in a bit. But I love to share, uh, hear Patrick share kind of his thoughts as well. I know you've branched out a little bit to things beyond multifamily. What are some of those things that you're looking at or you're interested in uh, as well? Looks like we got you on. I almost, there. I almost pulled the bronze in there. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, you looked a little like. Yeah, for a second. I, I feel very personal about this. I want to talk to myself for a minute. Um, my, yeah. So I, so some of my backstory is that so my my family actually collects oil, returns from energy investments, oil royalties, and so that's something that's just been a part of my life. And so I had a little more exposure to some of those alt assets like oil and gas that are completely uncorrelated. To real estate and a lot of the investors i talk to you talk about diversification talk about other areas a lot of investors i'm talking to they're saying oh i'm diversified i'm in multifamily self-storage assisted living commercial office whatever i mean but that is all real estate and that's what's really important for investors to realize that's one market cycle and the uncorrelated assets i think if you talk about diversification what other areas would be ones like oil and gas the government subsidizes housing they subsidize food and they subsidize energy. So there are others. In fact, on the energy side, we see dramatically higher tax advantages. Um, and so where they can take 75% of their investment in the first year off their adjusted gross income, it's like getting a 30% return. And if you look at these times right now, um, so why did I start launching diversified energy portfolios? Well, it's because 
Warren Buffett just put $12 billion into American energy. Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad guy, invested in North Dakota and Texas direct oil drilling, not in Exxon Mobil stocks, right? Uh, Chase Bank said, uh, CEO recently said, the best hedge against inflation is oil and gas right now. Why? Because multifamily is waning, right? And the cash flows are going down. While well, meanwhile, you see the macroeconomic situation of other essential needs like energy pulling in to back nationally from Russia and from, from other countries. We saw Elon Musk say that Elon Musk, it takes 80 barrels to make a Tesla. He even said, you should, we, should, we need to invest in oil and gas locally. So I do, I do think that um, while I think the cornerstone of investment portfolio should be in the highest risk adjusted return workforce housing and multifamily, I think it's very important that people consider completely non-correlated assets, where right now we see cash flowing and values going up in the future bright in the next 18 months in energy. And we see riding out a uh, correction in, in real estate and in multifamily. Yeah, so I agree. So yeah, there are other things. Energy is a very interesting space. Um, we are doing some stuff. We, we do this ATM machine fund that's super high cash flow and it's predictable monthly. It's a whole thing. I can just give a shameless plug for it. I'll stick something in the chat here that has some information on it. Uh, I also do precious metals. I, I think that precious metals, not as an investment, because people think is like, oh, this it's investing, but there's no return, but just as a hedge, they can't create it easily. So I think having some diversification and other types of things, and we're also doing something in the oil and gas space with a technology play that will come out soon. It's a very high upside, but uh, just something a little bit different. But uh, I wanted to come back to uh, multifamily because it's really the purpose of this um, this panel is really about multifamily. Um, let's go back. Uh, I want to kind of just do some scenarios here, and then we're going to get to questions because I know a lot of people that are on this webinar are really thinking like, you know, should I be actively like, like, is this a time to buy aggressively? Is this a time to hold or is this a time to sell? And sometimes you can't always sell if you're in a syndication and that's, you know, syndications are liquid for the most part until they start learning how to tokenize everything and then you can get out of it early. Um, which we're talking about blockchain technology and things like that. But uh, Ferris, what are you seeing? I mean, what, I guess, what would you say to someone who has, you know, maybe is in a number of syndications? Is this a great time to buy more? Is this a time to kind of hold what you have and kind of wait and what, see what's around the corner? Is it time just to kind of, you know, let's let's try to get out of this stuff and move on and do other things? Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. think it's going to be number three. I think it's not going to be. Number three. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should just quit, give up just some quit, of your yeah. stuff. No, no. I mean, I think ultimately, right, with any investment, right? It's about diversification and hedging risk, right? You know, and I think if you go into any investment, I learned this the hard way whenever I was much younger with the stock market, right? You know, it's your real best bet is, you know, cost averaging, right? Continuing to deploy, continuing to buy. And it'll, sometimes it'll be high, but sometimes it'll be low, right? And if ultimately you believe in the thesis of real estate, which is, hey, there is a lot more, you know, basically there's a, there's a lot less housing available than, than there are units, or there are people, sorry, right? And, you know, multifamily is a good hedge against inflation. And over time, right, time in the market is much better than timing the market, right? Well, then invest for the fundamentals, right? If you're the kind of person that's always trying to, you know, basically hope you're getting in at the, the bottom and selling at the top. I mean, that's a tough bet, right? And it's that's more gambling than it is akin to actual investing. And for us, I mean, ultimately, we still love the fundamentals of real estate as a whole. Right. And multifamily specifically. I mean, the thing we learned during COVID is what multifamily was kind of the darling of real estate. Right. Very resilient. It's very, very impactful. And, you know, people first need to you know, drink, they need to be able to eat and then they'd be able to sleep. And guess what? The government is going to support sleep. Right. And that got the attention of a lot of people. And so ultimately, it's still an attractive asset class. And, you know, if you're in it long enough. Right. Real estate, what I've learned, too, is even on the worst of deals. Right. If you can maintain and be in it long enough, right, a lot of times you can still come out, you know, with a reasonable return, right, even on the worst of deals. And so my big thesis is, you know, don't try to time the market, regardless if you're doing stocks, ETFs, Bitcoin, hell, you know, all of these different things, right? If you believe in the thesis of the investment, invest for that reason. And hey, Bronson, I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm really good at that. Today. Go. I think I'm especially good. Um, okay, so uh, I put this little chart in the chat here, and it's basically how rent and, and inflation are correlated. It shows from 1960, it's almost a straight trend line 
Um, and when inflation is high, it just means rents are going to continue to have to go up. Now, it lags a little bit. But in general, we know there's going to be continual demand for housing, particularly with all the shortages. They say there's between three and seven million or three and eight million shortage, uh, you know, shorting of, of housing units in the U.S. And some people would say it's a little less, but in general, there's a lot. So uh, I think that's, you know, long term. I don't know if there's really any better investment that we know has stability and is just rock solid than multifamily investing. Uh, Patrick, what are, you, what are some thoughts that you have as far as um, any other closing? Or, or, did you have something, Ferris, you wanted to add? I know you look like you're going to No, 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 I'm good. Well, okay. Why don't you add something in, Patrick, as far as um, any other thing, as far as multifamily we didn't cover? Um, well, I, yeah, I think we, we did cover a lot of ground and it's hard to go into some of these more challenging topics with, with keeping the, the content high level because there's, there's layers of the onion. Um, but I, I, I think that going into the recession as rents grow, as is commenting on that graph, there's a couple of things that I've seen in the data that I've looked at. And while that plays as a whole, you definitely need to be in those recession resilient markets and you need to be uh, considering asset class, specific types of, of multifamily, where I, what we've seen is that in sort of the, the lowest end or the D class is what we call, where they're razor thin disposable income, right? That's where inflation going, gallon going up a dollar, toothpaste going up a dollar, that cuts into a significantly greater proportion of their income. And a lot of times those jobs are some of the first ones to get hit. Um, so it's going to be more challenging, I think, for operators that are in that if they're not government funded and subsidized, but if they're in that lowest income. And then on the other side, what you see, what's going to, what typically happens is that in the sort of the newest A class types of assets, um, those people are renting because they want to rent. Uh, they're making a choice to rent that. And the workforce housing, what we call that, not the A or the D, but sort of the in-between B and C class, Ferris was talking about above 1990, and I like to say 20 to 50 year old range, those types of, those types of assets closer to the B uh, have, tend to have higher income paying jobs. They tend to be jobs that you could do from home. They have more disposable income and they're already in a high value place where they, we can you know, renovate to make it look like the A-class properties, but it's a lot lower cost. And I think if you're in those kinds of situations, you're in those markets that are recession resilient, you're in those assets, which traditionally fare better in downturns, I think you're probably in a really good spot as long as you're in with a sponsor that's been through a downturn and knows how to structure, as Ferris was talking about earlier, the deals to ride it out. You can find a lot of great opportunities right now. So we're going to uh, start taking some questions at this time. Again, we've got some uh, great folks that are going to have some awesome questions. So I can start calling you out one by one because I feel like I know at least half of you in here. So uh, there's some awesome people. And I'd love to get some great questions in your stuff that maybe keeps you up at night or stuff. We've got some operators in here. We've got people doing all kinds of stuff. But uh, let's just, let's just uh, put a scenario out there. Uh, who is uh, most at risk? right now when it comes to like what type of operator? I mean, obviously, you know, not good assumptions. They're assuming, you know, for super high rent growth and other things. But uh, I think, Patrick, you mentioned in markets that are not growth markets. But what are some other scenarios that you see like right now, this is a deal that I, I get concerned about just, just hearing about? Ferris, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, <laughs> it's going to be an operator year, right? Right. You know, disrupt equity where we were vertically integrated, we have our own management company. And, you know, thankfully we have that, right? And it does first and third party business. And, you know, on the third party side, we're getting approached by more and more people that I think really is that group that's at risk, which is, you know, they kind of, you know, they, the deals are, their deals are just doing okay, just kind of staying flat. And now they have this unexpected thing, right? Which is usually an interest cap cost, right? That's just gone up. And, you know, they're, they're kind of scrambling, right? And having to start to get back and kind of get back on the horse, so to speak, and really try to operate it just to kind of steer it a little bit more effectively. So I think those are the people that are most at risk, right? People that didn't have interest caps first and foremost, right? The second one is people that didn't have reserves and didn't really, you know, and I don't think anybody expected the, the you know, the, the cost of caps to go up so high, right? That is nobody expected that, right? And so if anyone says they did, I don't believe it. But really, you know, you have reserves for the unexpected. And so people that didn't have enough reserves or didn't have enough positive cash flow, those people are going to be scrambling and trying to figure out what they want to do. And so, you know, we just kind of have a whole, I'd say that group of people, the people that are most scrambling, and we'll just kind of wait and see. And so we'll see where those go in kind of 12 months from now. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Patrick, do you have some thoughts to add? I, I probably would echo a lot of what Ferris said because of the, the golden decade ish, a little more than 15 years or whatever we had there in multifamily uh, of things just going up and up and up. It was very analogous to what happened prior to 2007. And people, if they didn't go through that, they, they don't know how to ride those out. And so people were just expecting to buy and flip and buy and flip. And also their bridge loans, uh, they didn't buy extensions on those. So maybe it was a two-year loan. I've seen 18-month loans, maybe maybe a three-year loan, but not only we're we buying interest caps, but we're putting extensions in there so that we know we can go further down the road if we would like to extend the loan. So what's going to happen is a combination of those things are going to happen. They're either going to be forced to refi and can't, or uh, they, they, they're not going to be able to extend their debt coverage. They're they can't pay enough of their bills for their bank to be okay with allowing them to extend. So that's probably the biggest component that's going to drive, you know, this distressed operator deals or a combination thereof. Um, because if they, if one of those things or two of those things is happening and anything else happens, a fire, a flood, a tornado, they're out, right? If they didn't have the reserves necessary, um, which allows for individuals that are longer term focused, three to five, seven years, to come in and ride out any temporary market valuations and and produce great investments out of them. Yeah, uh, thanks for sharing yeah, that. And, and one thing to add to actually, you know, people have you know three one ones, right? That's what a typical floating rate deal looks like. The thing most people don't realize is they're not going to get that one, right? I mm -hmm. think everybody's assuming they're going to get that one, but you have to have certain yields, and that's something yeah. that we negotiate on every one of our floating rates just to make sure we can get that first one. Right. You know, and again, people need to go read your loan agreements, understand what do you actually need to meet in order to qualify for that one and start preparing a year in advance to make sure you can hit that. And so I think, you know, there's going to be people that assume they're going to be able to do those extensions and they're not going to qualify for it. So. And that's what happened to me in mind. 2000. Sorry. Yeah, but that's happened to me. So in 2000, it's your it's it's you don't just have to be able to pay your bills. You have to be able to pay your pay your debt with enough margin which is what he's calling the debt covered service ratio. You have to have enough cash flow coming out to not only pay it, but and then some. But then if you can, if you get under that, it's a technical default. They don't have to perform and they can take the property, which puts you in a really tough spot and puts the operators in a distressed level. And a lot of the operators were willing to take these big risks and highly leverage, which means very small down payments because they were non-recourse loans and they didn't feel like the risk was on them but the reality is a technical default is even if your debt covered service ratio or if your cash flow is not strong enough, that's still a technical default and it can become recourse. And so we're going to see some very interesting things happen with those specific operators. It will be interesting. There's another Warren Buffett quote. I guess this is Warren Buffett quote hour, but he says it's only when the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming naked, right? Yeah. So, and everything's going <laughs> fine. Like it looks good. But then when yeah. the tide goes out, I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess I didn't have any swimsuit on. So um, what, uh, we're getting some questions coming here. I want to get to some of these questions. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat. We will do everything we can to try to answer that, uh, within reason. Um, so David is asking what kind of cash on cash returns are you, uh, looking for given where interest rates are, or I guess let's just talk about returns in general. What are you seeing as far as cash on cash and, um, uh, just total IRR? I mean, obviously it's going down, but what, what are just some approximations that you think, oh, this is actually a decent deal now, which is different than how it was six months or a year ago. Um, maybe I'll, I'll answer that. I mean, we underwrote a thousand deals between January and May and right now, right. Cash on cash is still going to be tight. Yes. Your, you know, your, your caps have gotten a little bit more in your favor, but again, your, your cost of capital is still very high. And so, I mean, you're not, you know, I, I wouldn't say year one cash on cash has really moved much, right? I'd say it's kind of stayed where it is, right? Pricing has gotten better, but again, capital is more expensive. And so right now, attractive deals we're looking for, good deals, good locations, we're really looking for that 7 to 8% average cash on cash, right? Throughout the hold in that first five to seven year play. That's what I think market is today, right? It's hard to find deals that are 10%. I mean, if someone's presenting you a 10%, you should really ask yourself why and maybe understand how leveraged they're going, right? Because again, you can make you can make deals higher cash on cash if you can figure out how to get that higher leverage. But again, is it worth the risk? Yeah, that's true. Patrick, what about you? Yeah, 
Sure. Well, I mean, you asked me, what am I seeing out there? I mean, I, I, I have always seen a lot of wild things. I just saw like a 10, 15% cash on cash, 20%. What is he had 12% guaranteed recently? I saw some, I'm like, are you kidding me? There is a lot of crazy things out there, but from operators that know what they're doing and what are, what are, you know, what our deal is penciling at it's with Ferris. And now Ferris has something I'll, I'll make a plug for him. He has a preferred equity fund which allows for a better cash flow position in the early years of deals. And that's a way for passive investors to get cash. And I've, I've actually pointed some people to that to get cash flow sooner, right? In investments, if that's their, that's their main goal. But if you're talking about cash flow that is common equity or you're part of the down payment, the closing costs, and you want some of the upside as well as the cash flow, it's how much these multifamily deals are pushing out. And our deals, it's it's the like right the couple of deals we've been working on around a five percent year one, uh, six to seven percent year two, and a three percent year three, and or sorry, and and about a seven percent year three. And and the only reason why that works is because we're buying it distressed at a discount, we're buying it under market, unrenovated units, and we're forcing the appreciation by by re by renovating all the units in two years. So you don't buy properties that cash flow heavy on day one. You buy properties where you can work hard to bring those rents to market and cash flow as it goes forward. And that's what allows the average cash on cash return to get to about 8%, 9%. But that is over the average of the months from five years, which is definitely a ramp. And if you could do a refi, then it's a big leap because you've given a bunch of your capital back and then the amount of money going in the deal. So that's 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 something to look out for too, is the cash will include a refi or is it honest capital cash coming from the the, the profits of the, the building? Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. I've kind of, I've thought about cash flow more recently in multifamily deals that it's it doesn't, as much whatever you project, you can project whatever you want. We all know that it's just numbers, but um, it actually, it takes a while sometimes for especially for value add stuff for cash flow to start. And then it can be kind of unpredictable where it's like you make a lot of money in five years or through whatever you sell, but it's, it can be a little bit up and down. And that's uh, just a part of multifamily investing that I'm seeing. I think, you know, of course, when everything's great, the cash flow keeps growing, your deals keep going up. And then as things change, they can kind of, uh, you know, it, it, it's a little bit uh, very. The tide goes out, so to speak. Yeah, the yeah. tide goes out. There's some naked mm -hmm. people out there. Um, I've been pushing cash flow investors right now to alternative asset the side for multifamily. Multifamily is an alternative asset, but I know Bronson has an alternative asset, an ATM fund with much better cash flow. And I have diversified oil and gas deals as well, funds that have much higher cash flows. And those kinds of investments are actually in a really good position to cash flow now. Uh, and they're not as interest rate affected. So those are typically where I tell people to go. I feel like Patrick's got all the endorsements. He's making us look good here, Ferris. is building us up on our deals here. That's great. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Come on. Isn't, more more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we get a few more questions here. We do have a few more minutes. Uh, what, uh, where are multifamily cap rates and interest rates going to be in three to five years? And we're going to actually hold you to this in three to five years that we'll say you were wrong. <laughs> all right. Let, let me pull out my crystal ball. Let me pull out the crystal yeah, ball. Right I got there. one no, right I'm here for you. Yeah, my iced tea. Maybe that'll help me think better. <laughs> I get, you know, who knows, right? I mean, you know, uh, three to five years, right? Okay. Rates aren't going to go back to where they were, you know, last year. I don't think that's happening, right? And so cap rates will be in that four to five is my guess, right? You know, probably closer to five than four <laughs> of the newer stuff. And then kind of from there, but I, you know, that's a, that's a tough question, right? Because that's really a question that a flipper is asking, right? Mm -hmm. Again, ultimately, you know, time in the deal is better than timing the deal. And so if you believe in the thesis of fun, you know, multifamily, that's the reason to invest. And, you know, if you get cap rate compression, great. If you get decompression, you know, it's really not that bad either, right? Because if you're going, you're in a cash flow position, you know, why kill the golden goose? So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'd say, I'd say that what I do not see is us immediately going back to the comp compressed cap rates uh, that not necessarily where, where most of the, sort of at market deals we're trading at. And because there's a very different thing when you're doing value add like us, we're buying distress and discounted stuff and, and we're buying it at a rate, but it's it's mostly mostly empty or 10, 20%, you know, uh, not paid rent. So we can buy it at a cap rate, but then once we lease it up, we fix it, we fix a repair building, then the cap rate's different. But if you're looking at just fully occupied, stabilized cap rates and 
for a data point like down the road from Ferris and Houston. I, I think precisely what he's saying is that those, you know, B class cap rates are probably going to be in that four to five. I'd say that's a possibility that A class is going to be, you know, kind of on the lower end of that. But when you get higher into the C, you're probably going to be uh, above 5% in those regions. And it always it, it matters, you know, what asset class in the specific area of town. But what does that mean? That means you need to look at the underwriting. You need to ask your sponsors, what are their cap rate assumption at exit? And like one of the things that we put in all of our decks and Ferris does it too, and so does Bronson is a 10 to 30% cap rate inflation every year. That means we're assuming the properties are going to sell for less and less every year. We make up for that by adding value and create, creating income and creating value and renovating and producing a better asset. But you want to check for that because I believe that it will be likely that those hoping that are just investing and then wishing for the market to go up and sitting on just sitting on the sidelines watching it, they're in for a rude awakening. And it's it's a value play time. Um, right now, trying to work on what's called yield and just hoping the market will go up, that's that's a gamble. Yeah. Um, that you talked about uh, you know, when things go bad. I think it's I want to touch on this a little more. Brian's asking this question. About, you know, let's say when a deal goes bad or syndication unravels, how does it how does it work from an LP perspective? If investors lose money, it's usually for this reason or for these couple of reasons. Um, and, you know, is there capital calls or what does that what does that look like? Or what have you seen kind of in here's a deal that wasn't managed well and here's how it went down? I think we've all heard kind of war stories and horror stories of things that have happened. But do you do you have any thoughts on, you know, what it could look like from an LP perspective? If you invested a deal and all of a sudden they're having trouble. And what does that actually look like? Um, I can go ahead and hop in. I mean, ultimately, it depends. That's my answer, right? Understand what you're signing up for, what your PPM, you know, what it says, right? It, it, PPM is a, and your operating agreement are the two documents that outline the deal and what your rights are as an LP investor, right? You know, a lot of times, again, you're a little bit behind to the manager, right? So you're, you're betting on the jockey, not the horse. And so you really want to you know, understand what you're allowed to do, right? But ultimately you're you're still extending a tremendous amount of faith in the operator. And, you know, understand your capital stack, right? Your lender is always going to get paid first. So no matter if a deal is underperforming and let's say that the partners couldn't even make an exit quick enough, right? And the lender takes back control, right? They're going to sell that for whatever they can to get their money back. Any money left over, then you got to understand who's next up, right? Is there mes debt and that's second lien on the property or is there pref equity like we talked about earlier, right? Pref equity is essentially, it's almost mes debt without a lien, right? It's people that are sitting in front of the LPs that get paid their capital and return first before the LPs. Then whatever's left over is being split across LPs. Now a good operator is usually ahead of the problem. And, you know, and if they have to do a capital call for unforeseen, you know, events, great, they do a capital call, right? Hopefully that's something people don't have to do, but, you know, it's always a risk as an LP. And if a cap, you know, what is a capital call? Essentially, it's the operator saying, hey, we are now raising more money, right? We're having issues. We're trying to build a new building, whatever it is, right? You may have valid reasons to do it as well, right? We're getting stellar rents and we want to, we have a site of land next to us that we want to go add another 20 units, right? That could be a reason too. But ultimately it's a <clears throat> reason to raise money where the, and the, the operator raises the money. And as an investor, right, you typically get a chance to invest. And if not, you might, you probably will get diluted. Right. And again, all of this is outlined in the operating agreement and it explains how does money get distributed once there's money back. And typically, right, you know, for our deals, it says, hey, class A gets paid back the return and, the, and their equity first. Then class B, which is usually LP, gets their equity back. And then any remaining profits, right, if there's usually a preferred return as well, we give them that. And then, you know, then there's a share. So it outlines the steps. Look for those steps in your agreements just to kind of get clarity. So I wanted to uh, touch base here. We're kind of getting to the top of the hour. Wanted to share. I wanted to have an ask for everybody here. Uh, first of all, thank you to our panelists and for each of us being here. Um, this uh, We do post this now on a podcast called The Mailbox Money Show. It's right here. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to check it out, The Mailbox Money Show. If you have, I would love, if you've been enjoying, enjoying this content, take uh, 30 seconds and just write a short review helps us get better guests and find, not that these guests aren't awesome and amazing, but it helps us to continue to uh, find awesome guests to be, so we can bring better guests for you. Uh, secondly, we are going to have uh, our next panel will be in early January. We're going to have the 2023 multifamily outlook. Last year, we had Ken McElroy, Michael Blanc, and Rod Khalif. So we'll have some, some big stars, hopefully then as well. 
Um, so check that out. And then um, I did want to just ha give each of you guys an opportunity to uh, let people know how they can follow you. If they don't follow you, I highly recommend you follow Ferris. I highly recommend you follow Patrick. And so can, how can people find out a bit more about your deals, about your stuff you're doing? Let's start with Ferris there. All right. I mean, your company's called Disrupt Equity. Check out disruptequity.com. You, you know, add me on Facebook, add me on Instagram, Ferris Musa, F-E-R-A-S and M-O-U-S-S-A is usually the best way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Thanks, Ferris. And then they also do these live events. They just had one this weekend and it was, you know, 350 people. There's one in Houston. When, when are the Houston dates? It's in yeah, February. Absolutely. So for those of you in Texas, definitely get out there. Like Bronson said, we just had our Atlanta one this past weekend and, you know, had 400 people out there, packed house and, you know, good speakers. And it's really a chance to network. It's the multifamily investor network. So mfinvestornetwork.com. I think you could use coupon code disrupt to get a discount. And, you know, that will sell out. So the Houston one is going to be a packed house. I, mean, we're, I, I went last have... year in Houston. There were 600 people. There's probably be 800 people this year. And it's, it's, exactly it's worth right. flying anywhere you are in the country. I flew from LA. It was totally worth it. So I highly recommend it. It's, it's something worth getting on a plane yeah, for. I'd love to see but everybody out there. So if, if we I'm don't make any money on it and we don't sell anything either. So our goal <laughs> yeah. is to break even and getting good people out there. Yeah. yeah. There's probably two things that, that with, if I'm, if I'm the guy doing the plugs, I, you know, I was, I, I spoke at their one in Atlanta on, on wealth building strategies is incredible. And I'm doing the alternative assets panel and one in Houston. It's an amazing event. Nobody's pitching a coaching program. It's actual real people talking about investing. So I, it's one of the very unique things that I like about it. So I definitely check that out. Um, um, yeah. You Patrick, why don't you give your, how people can reach, reach out to you there. Yeah. So I uh, invest on mainstreet.com invest on, and then main and then street.com is our website. Right now we have alternative assets and multifamily and diversified energy income portfolios and uh, happy to, anybody who's interested, happy to give you a copy of my free book, invest on mainstreet.com slash book it was an Amazon number one bestseller persistence pivots and game changers. So check us out. And if you just put the promo code Bronson, at investonmainstreet.com slash book. And uh, you can also email me at patrick at investonmainstreet.com. I'll look forward to chatting with you. Patrick, I admire all your systems and your codes. And he, his, <laughs> his background is he did automations for like machinery and things in business, which is really impressive. So love that. Um, awesome, guys. Well, and if you are interested in reaching out, obviously you'll hear stuff about our ATM or multifamily stuff coming out. We'd love to hear any feedback that you guys have. Also, all of these guys are great podcast guests. So I know some of you have podcasts. I would love to be a guest on your podcast. I know Patrick would. I don't know Ferris is super busy, but he might be a guest on your podcast. But um, <laughs> anyway, well. we, we have some movers and shakers here. But just really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here and would love any feedback. If you have uh, guests that you would love to see on this. We typically do one on inflation. We do one on multifamily. We do different types of investments. We'd love to just continue to make this Bronson Equity Monthly Panel an awesome value for you. So everyone, thanks to our panelists. Thanks for being here. It's a time commitment, time away from your families. And for everyone who's listening, I think this is a really great conversation. The replay of this will come out shortly after the event. It will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you search Bronson Hill, you'll find our prior ones there as well. And uh, please share it with a friend. So thanks, everybody. Hope you guys have a wonderful evening. And uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thanks, Ferris and Patrick. Thanks. Have a good you night. Thank you so much, Bronson. Okay. Thanks, guys.